Praise God. I, I, well, I want to say something about this before I go into the message um, as, as sort of like a reflection or insight. Now, I, some of you have been in SIB care for long, uh, and you would have seen us do presentations up on the stage. Uh, we do uh, musicals and, and all, so, all sorts of things. But I want to say this, you know, this presentation that has been done by the Orang Asal is not just a presentation. Now, bear in mind that yes, they said they come up as, uh, and, and do this as a token of thanksgiving to SIBKL. And I want to just also, on behalf of them and the whole missions ministry, thank you for being involved in missions. <laughs> Praise God for that. Praise God for that. But you know what's the beauty about this? It's not just a presentation. It's worship. Don't, don't let that slide past you. This, what you saw on stage today is worship. It's not just the singing that we all did together, but it is this group of people, this group of pastors, evangelists, and even the heads of those pastors here worshiping God because you understand that Worship is not just in English. It's not just in Chinese. It's not just in uh, Indian or whatever other language. This is also worship. And when you sang along with them, you were not just supporting them, you were also worshiping God. And at that last great celebration, in fact, sometimes I wished I named my, the title of my sermon that one great celebration. But at that one great celebration that the Bible talks about, when all of us come together in heaven, worshiping God, we're not all going to sing hill songs or Planet Shakers or Bethel. We're going to sing songs that come from the root of every culture and language that God has already created. And if you think this was, you know, okay, uh, not bad lah. Sometimes SIBKL presentations can look better. Don't forget, it's worship. And when it is worship, it's beautiful. Because God sees the worshiper's heart. And when we all sing together with our different voices and our different languages and different musical instruments, and we worship God and raise our voice in worship to God together, there is that beautiful unity and diversity that we may not be able to see now because sometimes, you know, your beats per minute is different, your key is different, you, you know, you, you, you have to work so hard to put all these things together, but when God does it, and that's the cool thing about this one great celebration, you don't even have to plan it. How many of you have planned birthday dinners or, you know, especially the surprise ones? And you're like struggling because some people, and, and, and I'm guilty of that, I've been an invitee and I never RSVP. And, you, and you're the planner and you're like, what's wrong with this guy? Um, you don't have to plan this one last great celebration. God plans it. And when God plans it, it's awesome. It's so beautiful. So I'm going to say this little bit in, 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 in Malay to my friends here. Um, so forgive me if, well, I mean, you don't have to forgive me. They have to forgive me if my Malay is wrong. Uh, tapi kawan-kawan semua, apa yang dipersembahkan di atas pentas ini tadi bukan sekadar persembahan. Ianya kepujian kepada Tuhan. Dan apabila kita memuji Tuhan, Tuhan yang melihat hati kita sangat bahagia, sangat terharu. <laughs> uh, just so joyful, so glad. Kesenangan dalam hati Tuhan. Let's never lose sight of the wonder of who God is by what we see on the stage or what we see in our lives. Let's never lose sight of that. Because when we lose sight of the wonder of God and the things that He does and His heart for the world, what we risk doing is this. We risk turning what is holy and what God has done and, and the hand of God and everything into something that is common, something that is not worth worshipping about. And when we do that, and when we lose sight of who God is and the wonder of God in everything that He does, whether you see this on the stage or back in your homes, on your workplace, or your colleges, or wherever you are, 
we lose sight of God. And that's a very bad place to be. Let us never lose sight of the wonder of God. And so I want to acknowledge our Orang Asli pastors, Orang Asal pastors, and every one of us here who have been involved in the missions ministry. We, missions is the call of the church. Big capital C church. Missions is the call of the church. And for those of you who have been involved in this ministry, we, as a church, we don't just relegate missions to a ministry. But someone has got to do the administrative things. Someone has got to do the rallying. Someone has got to do the, uh, the actual uh, hands-on stuff. But as a church, what God has called us to see His heart for the world, to see His heart for nations, to see His heart for lives, to see His heart for the different ethnic groups and people who have had no access to the gospel, come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the call to all the church, to all of us today. It doesn't matter how long you've been a believer, you've been a believer for many, many years, you may have grown in a Christian home, or you've just become a believer. The call of God is for the world. And that call is for us. My message today is entitled, The God Who Calls. And when we say the God who calls, what we're really saying is this. This is a God who is unique, unlike any other gods in small g that we've heard of. Because this God is a God who actually speaks to us, communicates with us, and relates to us. Now, this is a special and unique situation in our faith because we can actually talk to God. We can actually listen to God. This is a God who in the Scriptures tell us, you can come to me with your complaints and I will hear you. There is an assurance from God that He hears us. So if you think of this relationship with God as a distant being, not involved in your life, whether in your ups or downs, that's not what Scripture tells us. The God we connect with, the God we talk to, the God we pray to actually hears us. But He also speaks to us. He also talks to us. He also communicates with us. And so we come to church every week and worship God together. And I don't know what your imagination of who God is is when you worship Him, but this is a God who, I was going to say sits down, but sometimes He doesn't, who is here and is listening and is enjoying worship when it comes from the heart of those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. That God is not just distant, some megalomaniac saying, worship me, worship me, no. This is a God who says, wow, I enjoy this worship. My heart is delighted. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to minister to them as much as they have ministered to me. This is a God of relationship. Why do I say all that? Because the God who calls doesn't just communicate with us like friends. He also calls us in the sense that He invites us. He calls us in the sense that He invites us to do what? Invites us to do what? Our scripture today is a very familiar scripture to a lot of us. It's from Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. I've put it up on the screen, but I do encourage you to look at your Bibles as well so you know where it is and you can highlight it uh, just as much as I've done on the screen here. But this is a passage that is familiar to a lot of us because of the verse uh, that I've highlighted in red. But let us look at this entire passage, 18 to 22, together uh, and and let the Lord speak to us uh, as we read His Word. So on the count of one to three, let's read Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22 together. One, two, three. 
While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Father, may you speak into our lives and call us, invite us to participate in what you are doing in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, this call isn't specific to just four men, Simon, James, John, and Andrew. It's not specific to just these four men. This call is God calling out to each and every one of us because this call reflects God's heart, not just for four men, but for all of mankind. But before I get into the call itself, I want to address something uh, important about answering God's call. As a child, my parents are here, so you can check with them and, and they can testify to this. Um, but as a child, we hear our parents call us from the other end of the house. Have you, have you heard that before? Or have you done it yourself before? It, it sounds like something like this. I'm in my room, usually not studying, and my mom's in the kitchen, he goes, Wayan! Now, there are different kinds of calls, right? If you say, Wayan, it's um, a more affectionate, you know, I just want to talk to you, and that kind of thing, right? If he goes, Wayan, most likely you're supposed to do a house chore. <laughs> but if it is, Ow, yo, Wayan, you come down now, <laughs> then you know there's eternal death. <laughs> Are waiting for you if you disobey. All right, now. And so, and so there are these kinds of calls, right? Uh, but most of the time, it is the Hawaiian go do house chores, all right? Uh, and, and essentially, it is this. Um, participate in what I want to see take place in the house. You're part of this home. Participate. All right? Clean the house, lah. All right? Uh, do your part. But how many of you, when you were a kid or, or if you are now, and you've heard your parent call you from across the house, um, decide, I'm going to do this. And then straight out of the room, go down the stairs, go, yes, mom, where's the mop? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to play my computer games, man. Until, until I owned my own home. And then things changed. Because it's my home, my hygiene level, my cleanliness level, my OCD level, all flare up like allergy. Right? The moment you see something on the floor, hey, why, is this, why is this here? Right? Pick up, throw. The moment you see a little mess or a little instability in the home, you put it back in order. And then when toddlers come, eruptions, you know. And then I have to learn grace, grace, grace. Um, but the reason why that switch took place is because I did not see the heart of my parents when they asked me to do house chores. Until I realized that that was my own heart. And when, I, when toddlers started coming into the house, well, I mean, they grew up in the house, I've become the very parent I wanted to disobey. I become the very person who says, she's here, so I can't say her name. <laughs> so and so, pick up the toys now. Here's the thing. When God calls us and God invites us, He doesn't just want us to do chores. He invites us by presenting to us His heart and saying, catch that heart. Catch that heart and then run with me. Catch that heart and then participate in what I am doing in this world. Catch that heart 
and, and, and journey with me as I lead you on into this amazing journey of what I want to see take place in this world and in that one great celebration at the end of the age. Catch my heart. That highlighted verse, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, has two aspects to it. The first, of course, is follow me. Before that, there's one last phrase I wanted just for us to remember this. We must know the one we follow. We must know the one we follow. Catch God's heart. Okay, now that we learn that we must know the one we follow, what did, God's, what did Jesus mean when he said, follow me? What did Jesus mean when he said, follow me? me. Now, by the time Jesus actually spoke to Simon, Peter, sorry, Simon, who's also called Peter, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, Jesus was already a recognized rabbi. He was already a recognized teacher of the law. He had already spoken in the synagogue, read out Isaiah, um, and that passage that says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, da, 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 all that has to be done, and then he says, this is now declared in front of you, i.e. me, right? That's, that's what Jesus was saying. He was already a recognized teacher of the law, a recognized rabbi, and he was walking along the shore. And his four fishermen, now if you're a fisherman, by the time you are a teenager, most likely you did not pass the standard of becoming a member of the elite teachers of the law or to be disciples of teachers of the law. You would go into your family trade. So like James and John, following their father Zebedee, they became fishermen. And it was more or less the kind of uh, job where you really knew that you've lost your chance to become cream of the crop Jewish boy who will become a teacher of the law, a member of the elite, the council, things like that. But here comes this rabbi, and Simon and Andrew cast their nets out to the sea. This guy comes by, this rabbi comes by and says, you too, follow me. Now that is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to follow a rabbi, to follow a teacher of the law. And quite rightly, I think what they did was they <laughs> let go everything that they have known, that they have ever learned, and decided, I will follow Jesus. Similar to James and John, the image is they left their dad on the boat and followed Jesus. But a call, a call follow me is not just walk behind me. But, a call, but the call follow me is this. In their time, they knew this was a call to personal discipleship. This was a call that said, not just will you walk behind me and do work for me and you know, become my administrator or my BA or my slave. This was a call to say, come, see what I do, learn from me. See what I do and learn from me. Now, the, the four disciples would have known what that would kind of look like if they were just to see the disciples of the other rabbis or the other teachers of the law. But the journey they took was probably one they never expected, one they never imagined would take place. Three years they were disciples of Jesus Christ. They begin to find out that this rabbi is unlike any other. This man would be labeled the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God, and eventually the Crucified One. They saw firsthand miracles performed. They heard his teachings Countercultural, very revolutionary at the time, but they heard his teachings firsthand. They saw how Jesus knelt down and affirmed the woman who had been found committing adultery and then stood up and rebuked the Pharisees. They saw it firsthand. And then, as most people are when they follow your disciples, you misunderstand your master. He says a few things, you get it wrong. You mis they misunderstood him, they've argued with him, 
they were reprimanded by him, and a lot of times they had to learn the lessons the hard way. All part and parcel of discipleship. But here's the thing, they also saw the power of God through their own lives. You know when Jesus sent out the 12 and then the 72, he said, go into all these towns and cities and, and gave them instructions and they went. They went proclaiming the kingdom of God and they healed the sick. Miracles performed in their very own eyes from their very own hands through the power of God because they were disciples of Jesus Christ, obeying Jesus Christ when he told them, do these things. They would also become fully aware that he was the son of God. And when you're fully aware that, you're the son, that he's the son of God, you also become fully aware of your sinfulness. Peter at one point says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. One of them, John, stood at the cross and saw his master crucified. The disciples would then see the risen master walk through walls to their utter shock, and then Jesus says, peace. He proclaimed peace that rested their hearts to know that the master that, that had initially was crucified had resurrected. This resurrected king would sit with them, eat with them, reinstate the position of the disciples who ran away when, his when he was crucified, reinstate their position and tell them, now you become shepherd of my flock. This risen master, the king, the son of God, would commission them and say, I give you the Holy Spirit that you would testify about me through all the world. You see, when Jesus said, follow me, and if you want to catch the heart of God, in those two words, it is basically this. He was saying, come, see who I am. See what I can do. Sense my heartbeat. See the Father God you have always longed to see. Because you see me, you see the Father. Let's build an intimate, personal, and powerful relationship together. Two words that have so much depth in changing lives of those four fellows he called and the eight other disciples that he called subsequently and then the entire church of Jesus Christ. Come, follow me. You know, as I thought about this, I often think, you know, how interesting it would have been for me to be in those times, you see the miracles, you see the dead come to life, all of that amazing things, right? But let me tell you this, that invitation is still applicable today. The miracles that the Bible tells us about still happen today. The power of God that is at work through each and every one of our lives is still as powerful, if not even more, today than the stories you read in the Bible. The question is this, would you follow Jesus? Following Jesus is sacrificial. You leave your security like they left their nets, like they left their father. You leave your security, what you hold dear in this life, in this world, and you offer your utmost to Jesus. And in turn, you take on a powerful journey with the one who created you and will show you the wonders of who he is and his power. It is not a mere joy ride. It is one with many bumps and many moments where the challenges will cause you to grow your maturity and dependence on Christ. But it is a life like no other. Follow me. In John chapter 10, verses 14 to 15, Jesus talks about himself as the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for my sheep. That's the relationship he's building with each one of us when he says, follow me. You come, 
you follow me. You see who I am. You sense my heartbeat. You, you know the power that is at work within you because of me. Come, follow me. Part two. There's always a part two. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. See, when the disciples first heard the call, they didn't just hear, follow me. They, they actually heard the second part. They also heard, and I will make you fishers of men. And if you think that this is a really, really good pun, it only applies in English, by the way. All right, fishermen, fishers of men, fishermen, fishers of men. But if you read it in the original, it will just mean you catch fish, now you catch men. I, I, I kind of wonder what he said to Levi, like, you know, at the text. You text men, now you... You collect taxes, now you collect souls. And I, I, I don't know, maybe he said something like that. But the, the pun was amazing. But it's only in English. What did they actually really hear? If you catch fish, you will now catch men. What does that mean? I mean, on hindsight, we know what it means. But for the disciples, what did that mean? What did that mean? It was perhaps only at the end of their time with Jesus on earth did they begin to realize what this means? After Jesus had resurrected, he showed the disciples that he was what, we call, what he called the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And so I want us to turn to Luke 24. Again, it's up on the screen. You can look at it there. Luke 24, where Jesus then explains what he was all about and what he has called us to do. It says, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. He opened their minds. If I were you, I'd like God to just do this to me. Like God, open my minds. And let me just see what you are saying in your word. He opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah, me, Jesus Christ, will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. That, when you followed me, you saw. When you followed me, you saw my life, my journey, and you saw that I was called the Messiah and that I died but would rise again on the third day. You saw all of that. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So here's, here's the follow me part. You've seen me, you know me, you saw John especially, you saw me die, but you know that I've risen again. What next? Repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in my name, Jesus' name, to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Friends, what we have witnessed, in fact, if you read the rest of this passage, it says, you are witnesses of these things. Do that when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Friends, we are witnesses of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ over each and every one of our lives. The sin that we held, the sin that we committed, the sin that tainted all of us was made gone, disappeared, because of the blood of Jesus Christ over our lives. The Messiah died for our sins. But because He's risen, we can preach repentance and forgiveness of sins, not just to our friends in, in, in college or in our workplaces, but in all nations. The orang asal. our missionaries in all these different countries, training people to become missionaries, being missionaries themselves. They're building what God has called them to do in bringing the gospel to all nations. And so, each one of us as well. Jesus' great commission, the passage we read about from Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, says, make disciples of all nations. 
we're not just talking about testifying about Jesus Christ to, to our close friends or close relatives. We're saying this gospel is so much bigger, so much greater, so much more powerful that people all over the world should really hear about this. People of all nations. So as a church, as SIBKL, we make the gospel, we make it our aim that the gospel reaches out to every people group. The lost are everywhere, but there are many who have no access to someone who would tell them who is Jesus Christ. They may not have even heard of Jesus Christ. And the call to make fishes of men, to make disciples, and to testify is for them as well, as much as it is for our neighbors. Now, I say that God's call to us as a church is because it is for the entire church. But not all of us will be called to go and become the missionary, the Philip Bo, or the very many people who have taken that step out of their comfort zones into different locations or different places and people groups that they're supposed to go to. But all of us here are to participate in God's mission. All of us here are to participate in God's mission. We may say that every missionary has sacrificed much to bring the gospel into these remote places. The question then is, if you're not, what have you sacrificed for the gospel? How have we supported and encouraged and enabled those who actually go and speak of the gospel, speak of the gospel to these people and said, we will be with you all the way? John Piper came up with this very popular phrase. It says, as far as missions is concerned, go, send, or disobey. Go, send, or disobey. Because you know why? That's God's heart. That's God's call for us as a church. It sounds harsh. Yes, I understand. But if we catch God's heart, we'd be so involved in God's mission for the world. Because, and think about this, at that one great celebration, that last great celebration that Revelations talks about, the people we've reached out to, the people we've called upon, the people who have heard this gospel because it is in God's heart will come and celebrate together and rejoice together. Missions weekend is not just a weekend where we talk about needs. This person has not heard the gospel. That people group have not heard the gospel. But missions weekend is also a celebration of what God has done in bringing many nations Bring the gospel to many nations. I read just now John chapter 10, verses 14 to 15. I want to close with that last verse after that. Jesus says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. But then he also says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock, one shepherd in that one celebration. I am so excited to see what's going to take place at that one great celebration. Because that is when everyone worships God together. And people, I have no clue who they are. I have no clue what people group they may have come from. But everybody worshipping together with their uniqueness in the creativity that God gives, brings us down back to that celebration and say, God, you are worthy to receive all honor and glory and power and praise. That one great celebration, that final end to God's great mission on earth. So Jesus called us in two, word, two sets of words. Follow me, and come and see who I am. Come and see what I can do. 
come and sense my heartbeat and I will make you fishes of men. And I will make you people who, having caught the heart of God, would bring so many people into the kingdom. We're going to collect the tithe and offering at this point. And even as I do, I want to just encourage you with a few testimonies of what God is doing with the Orang Asal ministry. Today's focus is the Orang Asal ministry because in 2016, God spoke to us and led us as SIBKL to take over the management of this ministry that spans throughout Peninsula Malaysia. It spans throughout Semenanjung. And so even as the uh, bags are passed, I'm going to say a word of prayer and then the, we'll let the bags pass. And then I'll share with you what God is doing with the Orang Asal ministry. Father, we thank you that you've called us. We thank you that you have enabled us and placed us in a position, Father, that we can be participants in what you are doing in this world and even in our own nation. And so God, may, may this tithe and offering that we collect be a praise offering unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Orang Asal ministry, as I mentioned earlier, started off in, uh, for us at least in 2016 when we took over the management of this ministry. And, and, we, and like I said just now, the ministry spans throughout Peninsula Malaysia. So I'm going to start off with the first slide here uh, of our Orang Asal ministry. The words are small, but all you need to really see at this point are the different locations that we're involved in. But more than that as well, you see there 40 uh, villages um, have already been reached with the gospel in 2018. A church is growing, ministry is being done there. But check this out, because of what God has planted in our hearts and His passion to see the gospel spread as far and as, and as deep as it goes, we're looking at 26 new villages, new outreaches next year. 26 villages, 26 new communities of God-loving people worshipping God together. And so you will see there in this, in this diagram uh, the different zones and the different heads of the zones were introduced to you today. Uh, Zone Utara in Ulu Perak, uh, we're increasing the number of villages that we're reaching out to. Uh, Zone Cameron Highlands, um, uh, I was going to say it's a very cool place, but on fire for the gospel, all right? On fire for the gospel, all right? So um, I, I'll just I'll tell you a story. I was in, I was in Cameron Highlands uh, a couple of years back, and uh, um, I stayed in this nice place, uh, uh, and, and I was taking a walk, and by that, at that time, my, my elder daughter was only about a year plus, uh, and I was walking, uh, just taking a walk, just, you know, enjoying the cool weather, and I met these two Orang Asal people. Um, I can't remember what tribe they were from. Um, and they were just sitting at the roadside and staring into the jungle. So me being very curious, uh, I asked them, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you staring in the jungle? And they says, oh, we're looking for birds. We're bird watching. So me being the city boy, I decided I need to learn some bird watching. And I sat down with them and I said, what are you looking for? So my daughter is still with me, right? I'm still carrying my daughter, so my daughter is still with me. I said, what are you looking for? And then they told me, oh no, the bird looks like this. I'm, looking, I'm also looking for a monkey and <laughs> all sorts of funny things they were looking at in, in the jungle. Uh, but then I realized that one of, these, one of these two boys, he was walking with a limp. Now, the reason I know is because I had passed by them before and they were walking at the time. And so when I came back and I saw them sitting down, I said, so one of you has a limp, right? Uh, and he says, yeah, sebab kaki saya sakit lah and some of the problems there. So I said, can I just pray for you? And, and, so I, and so they said, yeah, sure, you know. Um, eventually found out that they attend a church, uh, but they told me that the name of the kampong that the church is in, I have no clue where that is in Cameron Highlands. Uh, but I prayed for him. And I said, God, may you just heal this leg and restore it in my broken Malay. And then, you know, this, this guy's eyes just like, had this shocked face on it. Because then he said this, panas, panas. Panas, literally, okay? Um, unfortunately, it was my daughter who's my witness, so <laughs> um, she can't testify to that. But she says, panas, panas. And, and I said, but you know, sometimes when you experience heat, it is uh, a painful kind of heat, and you, the heat you're trying to get out of. 
Uh, but sometimes the heat is like deep heat. You know, you use counterpane and you know, oh, it feels so nice, right? That kind of heat. Um, and, and that was the kind of heat it was, it was feeling. The shock was because it's, nobody's putting any ointment. And I said, that's God. That's God healing you. That's God restoring your leg. I, I believe it was the right ankle. And it's God restoring your leg and making sure that you are healed. Um, and you can see the joy in his heart. He was like, God heals me. God heals me. Praise God for that. Amen. Praise God for that. But you know what I want to tell you? Let me just get past this. Zone Cameron Highlands, Tanjong Malim, uh, Zone Selatan Johor, uh, as well as Zone Tengah Pahang. A lot of work is being done uh, in reaching out to this uh, groups, these this peoples, these kampongs, these villages, um, and, and even uh, what I'll show you next, water baptisms. Whoa. Amen, hallelujah. All right, um, water baptisms. Uh, if I can get back to that slide. Uh, Life Generation, the campus ministry that I serve, it had a water baptism yesterday. Uh, we, we praise God for the seven lives that were baptized and declared you know, publicly their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, but let me tell you something about the baptism pool in SMCC. It's got hot water. <laughs> I, I was walking out to the basement pool and I'm seeing steam come up, you know, like wow, thermal spring. These guys though, next level, all right, taking bath in a, taking bath, being water baptized in a water tank, all right, in the river, in the ocean. But you know what? When a community comes together and says, I publicly declare my faith in Jesus Christ, that is celebration right there. That was celebration. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. A celebration right there. Lives are being changed. Lives are being transformed for the glory of the gospel. The next one. Um, again, more water baptism pictures, more people just saying, publicly declaring their faith in Jesus Christ. Mission trips. And so SIBKL has sent teams. Uh, Pastor Chok mentioned the, the, young, the, young, the young, strong men when they help in crisis relief. But we've got mission teams all over the place with different kinds of age groups, different kinds of people of different experiences going into Cameron Highlands uh, at Kampong Telimau, into uh, Kampong Yang and Kampong Tadari in Zone Tengah Pahang, as well as in the Zone Utara in Greek, Pera, and, and Greek is not uh, the language of the Bible, uh, it is in Pera, uh, high up north, uh, and as well as in Zone Slatan Johor. There are mission trips where we can participate in seeing what God is doing. You look at these guys and they're day in, day out. These pastors are day in, day out, toiling the ground with the gospel. We get a chance within a few, a few days to just see and praise God for what He's doing in those lives, in those groups. I'm going to just end with this Recap of what God has said. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Go back into your workplaces, your colleges, your, your, your homes and become fishers of men in those places. But also think and pray and send and perhaps even for you, if that's God's call for you, to go to the places and the peoples that have never, not just never heard of the name of Jesus Christ, They've, they don't even know that such a gospel exists. Because if we've caught God's heart, these nations fall deep within His heart. And friends, I don't know how long we will live and I don't know when Jesus comes back. But when Jesus comes back and restores the new heaven and the new earth and that great celebration where all of us come together to worship God, it will be an awesome time of worship and you have played a part. You and I have all played a part in being contributors to this great celebration, this great banquet for all of us who declare God as our Saviour. Father, we commit our lives to You. Not even as we celebrate what You have already done in these nations, 
in the Orang Asal ministry, in the lives that have been changed. We praise you, O oh God, and we thank you that we have been privileged to be a part of what you are doing. And God, you are so great that even the, the little things that we've offered to you, you have exponentially made that such a powerful expression of your love to these people. God, we want to commit ourselves to you. Make us your vessel, your offering. Make us the people you want us to be. That even as we follow you and we catch your heart, we catch the heart of you, of, we catch your heart for the nations. We catch your heart for the peoples. We catch your heart for those who have never had the opportunity of even hearing the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And wherever you send us, oh God, whatever you've called us to do, Lord, may we always have this in our hearts and in our minds, in our prayers and in our thoughts to see, Father, that these lives are changed for the glory of your name. And Father, we look forward to that one great celebration where all of us will worship you with one voice, yet in many different expressions of your creativity, O oh God, in glory and praise to you. We thank you, Father. Separate us today with your blessing, O oh God. And Lord, may this week not just be a wonderful week with good things that have happened in our lives, but a wonderful week where we hear even more testimonies of life's change for the glory of your name. We praise you, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's just give God the glory. Let's praise God. Service is over. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you. We'll see you next week.